And tonight, I'm super excited to introduce you all to Dr. Jessica Allen, who is a lichenologist with Eastern Washington University. I think it's, um, this wasn't planned, but it's super appropriate to have on the day after International Women's Day, Women's Week, to have a, a lichenologist who names lichen after super rad women. Um, so I think that's, and after some of my favorite women, Dolly Parton and Oprah Winfrey, which, which is pretty cool. Um, Dr. Jessica, Dr. Allen has a book coming out. Um, if folks didn't know it, I, I think it's a, a super cool idea on urban lichens. Um, so it's, it's uh, the title is Urban Lichens, A Field Guide to Northeast North America. Um, today, she'll be talking about Northwestern lichens and she'll be our field guide for the evening into the wonderful and little seen world of lichens. So Jessica, take it away. Okay. There we go. Um, thank you so much, Sai, and thank you for the invitation, first of all. And to all of you who have tuned in for the evening, I do see that there are even some folks here from the East Coast. Uh, it's quite late for you, and I really appreciate you coming out for this. Um, I am a lichenologist. I'm a, an assistant professor at Eastern Washington University. Um, I'll give you a little bit more background on myself. I'm from Southeastern Washington, um, born and raised in the Tri-Cities, and I graduated from Richland High School and then went on to study at Eastern Washington University where I earned my bachelor's degree. Um, and then from there, I moved to New York City and worked and studied at the New York Botanical Garden and the City University of New York Graduate Center, um, where I earned my PhD. And then I spent some time in Switzerland uh, studying lichens uh, at the Swiss Federal Institute for Forest, Snow, and Landscape Research just outside of Zurich. And now I am really grateful to be back in the Northwest, um, where lichens are just so gorgeous. Um, and so through all of those travels, I've been really fortunate to study with many excellent lichenologists and to study lichens all over the world and to see so many gorgeous species. Um, some of my favorites are pictured here. But my love of lichens did start in the Northwest in Washington and Oregon. Um, and Essentially, any time I wasn't in class, I was outside, and my mother would take us hiking and camping in the Cascade Mountains and on the Olympic Peninsula, and I remember bringing back pieces of old man's beard, Asnia longissima, uh, to hang up in my bedroom, and my father was a farmer and a rancher, and so we spent a lot of time together out in the shrub step, either on horseback uh, or by pickup truck, and I still can, I still remember seeing these, like, the oranges and the yellows on the rocks as a kid. So I don't have a memory of like lichens coming into my consciousness. And this might be the case for many people in the Pacific Northwest because we live in an area where lichens are such large um, conspicuous components of the landscape. Um, and I suspect, I suspect that's why many of you are here tonight, right? You have seen lichens, um, you see that they are gorgeous, that they're abundant, and they are also somewhat mysterious. Now, once I was a student at Eastern Washington University, I started looking at lichens through a scientific lens. And at that point, everything changed, especially once I realized where the edge of our scientific knowledge is um, with lichens. There is just so much that we don't know about them, and there's so much that remains to be discovered. And so tonight what I hope to do is to share a little bit of that lichen wonder with you all um, and to unravel a few of the mysteries of these organisms. Now our traditional um, maybe textbook definition of a lichen is that they are symbiotic organisms composed of a fungus that makes up most of this structure, potentially you know, providing a little space for an alga to live. And that, al that alga will live inside of the lichen and it harnesses energy from the sun and it absorbs carbon from the atmosphere to make sugars, um, which it gives to the fungus in return for its home. This very congenial relationship. Now, 
In not quite the same framing, but many years ago, um, the composite nature of lichens was first uh, noticed and reported on by Simon Schwendener in 1869. Um, and since then, over 25,000 species of fungi that form these lichen structures and relationships have been described. And there are many thousands left to be described still. We also know that lichens, that this lichen relationship has evolved at least 12 times across the fungal tree of life. Um, and that in total, about 20% of known fungal diversity is are lichens, right? So these are not a small group of fungi. Um, and they are also abundant, right? So they live on every single continent on this planet and almost every single land-based habitat you can imagine um, from the Arctic to the tropics to really hot, dry deserts. Uh, and in total, they cover about 8% of the Earth's surface. Again, nothing to scoff at. Now, the nature of lichens, um, the nature of the, sort of the lichen symbiosis and what these organisms actually are is really complex. And its recent research has added to this story of complexity. Um, and I would argue that there are two main reasons for this. And the first is that lichens really sit at this fulcrum of the macroscopic and the microscopic world. They have a foot in sort of each of these realms and they unite biodiversity across many scales, uh, be well beyond what we as humans can easily observe. And the second is that they really only exist as interacting organisms, right? So there's no lichen that's a single organism that we can point to. They only exist through interactions between species. And so tonight I'm going to sort of wander through all of these scales, um, starting large with some mammals and birds, working my way down to fungi, algae, bacteria, and even to the scale of single molecules, which will inevitably bring us back up to a really large scale perspective. And I'll start with the largest uh, and most famous lichen eaters, which are caribou. So these animals live in the Northern hemisphere in the boreal forest and in the tundra um, in both North America and in Europe and Asia. And there are many different types of caribou, but we can sort of broadly group them into woodland caribou, caribou who live in forests and bare ground caribou. Now, caribou eat a number of different species of lichens. Um, some of their favorites are the rain, aptly named reindeer lichens um, or reindeer moss, so lichens in the genus Cladonia. These lichens live on the ground. And then the woodland caribou also eat lichens that live in trees and on shrubs. So this includes things like the hair lichen in the genus Bryoria and oak moss uh, in, the, in which we would call Avernia prunastri. That's its scientific name. Now, um, lichens comp comprise a really large portion of the caribou diet. Um, so we're talking like up to three kilogram grams of lichen eaten per day by a single caribou. That's like two large trash bags full of lichens. This is not a small amount. Um, and in many cases, caribou eat lichens in the winter. So it's a winter forage for them while there, isn't, there aren't a ton of plants for them to eat. Um, but this isn't the case everywhere. So a study done in Ontario a few years ago um, actually found that the caribou there were eating lichens year round. Like even in the middle of summer when there were plants around, they're still eating a, quite a few lichens. Um, so the point being that like caribou really fundamentally rely on lichens to meet many of their nutritional needs. Now, woodland caribou have been in decline, uh, their populations for, you know, well, close to a century now. And in the inland Northwest, in Northeastern Washington and Idaho, we've um, sort of had a front row seat to this. Uh, just over a year ago, the last remaining individuals in this herd um, were actually moved north into British Columbia because there were too few of them to continue um, persisting as a herd. Um, and so, We've seen this going on for decades, and um, this map shows the historical range of caribou in our region in gray, and then the distribution as of 2014 in green. So we see what a drastic reduction there has been, and even further since then. 
Um, and this same story is playing around, playing out throughout the range of the woodland caribou. Um, so in this map, we see the dotted line is the southern extent um, historically of the woodland caribou in North America. And in the brown, we see the current distribution. So this March north. Now, there are many reasons that um, we are seeing these declines likely um, in caribou throughout their range. And part of it does come back to the lichens. So those tree dwelling lichens that I showed you before, um, really for them to be really abundant and luxurious, um, they rely on mature old forests with large trees um, that are kind of widely spaced. There's a fair bit of light in there. And uh, when these forests are logged, when the timber is extracted, you know, the lichens are taken with them. And usually when those forests are replanted, the trees are at a much higher density um, and the lichens can't flourish there. And often they're even cut at such a frequent cycle that the lichens really can never get a, um, that strong of a foothold back in that system. And, you know, what do we know? No lichens, no caribou. So. Um, again, this is like a really complicated issue, but that's a really one of the main reasons we're seeing this continual decline in caribou. Now, even though caribou are the most famous lichen eaters, many other mammals do eat lichens um, from deer to mountain goats, moose, pikas, and marmots, and northern flying squirrels too. So I would say many very cute animals do eat lichens. Um, for these these guys, uh, lichens are usually a winter forage, a supplement to their diet. But there is another animal um, that relies quite a bit on lichens, and that's the golden snub-nosed monkey, which is found only in southwestern China. Um, and this primate can live in colder temperatures than any other primates in the world, except for humans. Um, and so they do rely heavily on lichens in their diet in the winter. <clears throat> now, birds use lichens too, maybe not so much for food, but for sure for nesting materials. And there are a lot of um, examples that we could draw on here, but one would be the golden plover, which nests in the Arctic tundra. Um, their nests are depression in, depressions in the tundra that they line with lichens and mosses. Um, and then, of course, like the most charismatic would be the hummingbirds, which do tend to stick lichens onto the outsides of their nests. Um, and in what's this relationship with hummingbirds and lichens on nests is sort of, we can see that this probably benefits the hummingbird, right? The nest is well camouflaged with lichens on it, um, but actually the lichens might be getting something out of this too. So in a recent study, um, they found that the hummingbirds are actually can move these lichens really long distances. And then even after the nest is abandoned and it's been a few years, uh, these lichens keep growing. So essentially these birds are helping the lichens disperse across um, throughout the landscape. But this theme of camouflage is really important and it, it comes up quite a bit, um, especially when we start looking at smaller organisms like insects. Um, and my favorite example of lichens as camouflage are found with lace wings. So lacewing larvae, pictured here, uh, coat themselves in lichens. And in a specific lichen, they only use dust lichens. Um, and there are many reasons for this. So first of all, great camouflage, of course. If you ever start looking at lichens more closely, uh, at some point you are definitely going to see one move a little bit. And it's probably a lacewing larva with some lichens on the top of it. Um, and another good reason to put dust lichens all over yourself is that they're highly water repellent. And so essentially it's like a lichen rain jacket. Um, and then on top of that, they produce many antibiotics, uh, many antifungal compounds. So you're keeping yourself kind of clean there. Um, but what happens next is even cooler. So once this larva is ready to metamorphose, it will encapsulate itself completely in the dust lichen. Uh, it'll metamorphose. And then when it's done with that, it will cut this like perfect little cap off of that capsule and pop it off. And then off it goes onto into its life from there. But this relationship between lace wings and lichens seems to go back in time, like way back in time. We're talking 165 million years back in time. So last year, 
um, there was this incredible paper published where these researchers found fossils of lacewing wings and these sort of prehistoric lichens shown here in this artist's rendition of these branching brown structures. Um, and what they noticed is that the wings of the lace wings look an awful lot like the lichens, right? So they are hypothesizing here that these lace wings are actually using lichens as camouflage way back in the age of the dinosaurs. And here's what those fossils look like. And I, it, the top one is the lace wing wing and the bottom one is the lichen. It's like the resemblance is truly remarkable, I think. And the more you, that you look at lichens, the more insects and spiders that you'll probably end up seeing. So here are two pictures that I took from North, in North Carolina. You know, nowhere particularly exotic, um, but they're hanging out there uh, well camouflaged. But in the tropics, we have some really spectacular examples of insects adapted to camouflage with lichens. So the first there is this lichen Katie did, um, which is looks pretty much exactly like the old man's beard lichen, lichen usnea, right? That's in the top right. Um, and then the spiny leaf insect from Australia, which I know I showed this yesterday to my sister and she had a hard time finding it. So I'll leave you to look for a minute, but really it looks exactly like a lichen there and there it is. I mean, it's amazing. And so I, what, this isn't like a, an infrequent occurrence that there are kind of critters hiding in lichens, um, but instead really a ton of insects, a ton of invertebrates are exquisitely adapted to live in and on lichens. They are really, you know, really thrive the most in a landscape in a habitat covered in lichens. Okay, so we've come to the fulcrum point of the talk um, and we've come to the actual lichen itself. Um, and for many of us, when we see lichens out in the world, we want to think, okay, this is one organism, right? Based on, you know, just how we think about biodiversity, um, it looks like such a cohesive unit. There's just like one thing going on here. And that is the furth furthest thing from the truth. And so if we can, if you can come with me for a minute and you, we can dive into this lichen, and really uh, see what is going on in the lichen, what I like to call the lichen microverse, there is so much action in here. So we have that main fungus, but we have tons of other fungi. There are algae, bacteria, tiny worms, tardigrades. Um, it is just, it is wild what we can find inside of a lichen and on a lichen. And I'm not even going to talk about this main fungus yet. We have a ways to go before we get there. I'll start with the tardigrades, which are sort of arguably one of the most charismatic members of the lichen microverse. Um, these are also called water bears. Um, and a couple years ago, they were in like front and center in the spotlight uh, when the lunar lander, cra lunar lander crashed on the moon. And we heard about the these tardigrades being spilled onto the moon. Um, and it turned out that Nova Spivak had actually like snuck a vacuum packed container of tardigrades onto the lunar lander. Um, and I was just reading one of his interviews yesterday and he was uh, very, seemed quite proud of being the first space pirate. Anyways, he claimed that the vacuum packed container couldn't possibly have spilled on the moon, but either way, either if they're in a container or not, there seem to be tardigrades on the moon now. Um, which is actually uh, kind of a perfect example of how tough tardigrades are, right? So uh, we know that they can dry out and um, remain dormant for up to 10 years and then be rehydrated and be like ready to go and just fine. And this is a characteristic that they share with many lichens. So, you know, they live in and they live on lichens really frequently. And the tardigrades and lichens share, uh, also share a you know, I would say a penchant for space travel, although they're being sent by humans into space, so not of their own free will, I would say. Um, but lichens have, have been shown to actually withstand the very harsh conditions in space, right? So we have, we have like really intense radiation, the vacuum of space, the cold out there, um, and a group of scientists have sent them out 
put them on the outside of the International Space Station, brought them back to Earth, and they were fine. Like that was not apparently that problematic for them. And indeed, um, that same group of researchers actually put lichens into a growth chamber that mimicked the conditions on Mars. And not only were the lichens okay, but they were like slightly physiologically active. So lichens seem pretty, these at least extremophile lichens seem well adapted for space. Um, and one thing that I find most remarkable is that lichens can withstand uh, gamma radiation at 12 thousand times the level of what would kill a human being. And they're actually, the toughest lichens are tougher than tardigrades. They can withstand radiation two and a half times stronger than what a tardigrade can take. So I think this like extremophile nature of lichens um, is a really widely known characteristic, but I would point out that um, that's really only a subset of species and many species are not so resilient uh, and they are um, actually, we do have many rare and sensitive species out there as well. <clears throat> okay, so in there with the tardigrades, we also find a lot of tiny worms called nematodes. Um, and indeed, many, a number of species of nematodes have been described from only within lichens. And we can take that a step further. And what these scientists found was that some of those species eat algae some eat fungi, some eat bacteria. Um, and so this to me really speaks to lichens as miniature ecosystems um, because we see this like partitioning of different food sources by different species within the lichen, which is something we expect to see sort of in at an ecosystem level. Okay, so we finally come to talking about fungi. Um, now, uh, remember that fungi are actually much more closely related to animals than they are to plants. And the fundamental makeup of fungi are these strings of cells, these filaments of cells that we call hyphae. These are kind of the basic building blocks of most fungi. And I'm still not going to talk about yet about that main lichen fungus, um, because within the lichen, there are many, many other fungi. And there are many fungi that actually um, just seem to be kind of at a low abundance and living inside of the lichen and not really causing um, any major harm or anything like that. We would call those endolichenic fungi. And you may have heard of endophytes. So these are fungi that live inside of leaves that also don't cause any symptoms. You know, they're just hanging out there apparently. And uh, what's really neat is that the endophytes, the fungi in leaves are very similar to the fungi that live inside of lichens. Um, and these endophytic, these endolichenic fungal communities can be pretty diverse, up to 48 species in a, of fungi in a single lichen. Now, some fungi are not quite as friendly in the lichen. Um, indeed, there are many fungal species um, that actually parasitize lichens. Uh, we call them lichenicholus fungi, fungi that inhabit lichens. Um, and they come in all, they're like, actually look pretty wild, uh, especially when they're producing these like fruiting bodies, they're spore producing structures. Some of them form galls. Now there are over 2000 described species of fungi that specifically parasitize lichens and counting. There is a ton of diversity here. And then there are also lichens that parasitize other lichens. Um, and so an example of this would be the lichen diploschistes, um, which sort of starts out its life on Cladonia. These are the British soldier lichens. Um, it steals its alga and then it grows over it eventually killing it. Um, and a neat detail to add to this story is that the the spores of diploschistes are really triggered to germinate and start growing in the presence of a particular compound called fumar proto citraric acid. Anyways, this acid is produced by the cladonia. So in essence, those spores, um, once they sense that fumar proto citraric acid, they can say, okay, let's go germinate and you know, go on with their uh, growth here. Now, there, a, a few years ago, um, there was a lichen paper published by a group of researchers that garnered 
a ton of attention in this popular media. Um, you may have seen this like rewrite the textbooks. There's another symbiont. Um, and in this study, um, which included some really gorgeous microscopy, these researchers found that there were these particular yeast, um, and yeast are fungi that grow in a unicellular form instead of in those strings of cells that we saw. And so what they found was that there were yeast in the outermost, these special yeast in the outermost covering of the lichen, the outermost layer of the lichen. And then they also found that the present, the amount of these yeast cells was correlated with a particular acid called vulpinic acid. So the more vulpinic acid, the more yeast that we had. Now, um, the, there was this big claim that this is an added symbiont, which really kind of shook up the lichen world and has kind of spurred on a lot of research. Um, and there's been a lot of follow-up research since then. And I'll give you a, a few snippets um, in that same year, that fungus, that yeast, was actually formally described by a different group of researchers as the genus Cyphobacidium. And the, these researchers used the uh, sexual fruiting bodies of these fungi to describe them. And these are, form galls on lichens. So they look a lot like those parasites I showed you on the last slide. Um, and this is really a, uh, you know, the typical standard approach to lichen taxonomy. Uh, just last year, another group of researchers looked at six species across Europe, and they sequenced the algal DNA from many individuals of these species, and they sequenced the yeast from all of these as well. And then they asked this question, what, is, what does the relationship between this, our main lichen fungus and the algae look like? And what they found was that they are really like closely intertwined. They seem to just go move around the landscape together to disperse together. Um, there's some really clear specialization there. And then they asked, what is the relationship between that main fungus and the Cyphobacidium yeast? And what they found was that the yeast uh, were genetically more shaped by the environment and the climate than they were by that main fungal partner. So. Um, the conclusion here is that it doesn't seem to be acting like a symbiont in this particular relationship, at least with these six species. And then there were a number of other publications um, recently that looked into this. And these first two here, um, what they were trying to do was looking at a whole bunch of other species of lichens to see like, are these yeast there? And in this first study, they looked at 339 species and the yeast weren't in 97% of them. Now, if we want to make a, if we, you know, if we want to say that this yeast is required for the symbiosis, we would expect it to be in all lichens. So this is kind of some evidence to the contrary. However, the method used wasn't super targeted in this paper, um, but in the next one it was, they were really looking for the yeast. And again, they didn't find it in a lot of species. So it seems to be, um, from these two, we seem to have some evidence that the yeast are restricted to only certain lichens potentially. Um, and then there were some really bold statements thrown out here too. Um, for instance, um, saying that this Basidiomycetes yeast and lichen thalli are not a third component of symbiosis, but rather the vegetative propagules of mycoparasites. So this conversation has been ongoing in the lichen con research community. Um, and I even saw another paper was published today on the topic. And what I think has been, you know, regardless of exactly what this yeast is doing and where it is, I think the fascinating thing about this story is that it points to the fact that we apparently, um, we still are not 100% sure what all lichens are and that they seem to be very, they seem to be more and more complicated. Um, and, uh, I will also say that like the publication of this paper has spurred on a ton of research into the nature of the lichen symbiosis. So it will be really fun to continue to watch this scientific story unravel over the coming years. Okay, so um, moving on from fungi, from the fungi, we can talk a little bit about the algae, right? So in the lichen, these algae are photosynthesizing. So they're 
taking carbon from the atmosphere, using the energy of sunlight to make sugars. And in most lichens, these algae are kept in a layer just underneath the upper, um, the uppermost layer of the lichen. So they're sort of protected, but they're also getting plenty of sunlight there. Um, luck, you know, sometimes we give things really easy names like algal layer in science. Um, and most of the time, these in most lichens, those algae are what we call green algae. Many of them are in the family Trabuxiophyceae, not all of them though. And about 10% of lichens actually don't associate with green algae, but instead associate with cyanobacteria. So these are bacteria that fix nitrogen along with being able to photosynthesize. They're pretty spectacular. And then there are some lichens that actually have both a green alga, algal symbiont and a cyanobacterial symbiont. These are what we would call a tripartite lichen. Um, and these are really neat because they tend to keep the cyanobacteria uh, in these little pockets. And in some species, those pockets are actually on top of the lichen, so you can even see them there as these little dark spots. Okay. Now, it is a little bit more complicated than that. So, you know, we have, we sort of had this like one fungus, one like one alga paradigm for a long time. Um, but it turns out that the main algal partner can actually be multiple species. Um, we see uh, at least some genetic diversity in there. And we can also see that in some lichens, um, they're actually an entire community of algae, of microalgae living in there that can be fairly diverse. Um, and so again, we an unexpected diversity in around every turn here. And it just keeps getting better when we look at the bacteria. So um, take, we'll take the lungwort lichen as an example. This is Loberia pulmonaria. Um, and this research group sequenced all of the DNA out of this, these lichens. And they tried to figure out um, what to which organisms all of that DNA belonged, right? And so what you see on this, on the figure on the far left, um, everything in green, um, that includes the main fungal partner and all of the fungi and also all of the algae. And then the bacteria you can see here are in pink and orange. So really most of the, most of the DNA sequences that they were getting out of this lichen were from bacteria. And those bacteria, bacterial communities are incredibly diverse. For me, this really reminds me of like our human bodies and the dis discovery that we are covered in bacteria, that we have tons of bacteria in our gut. And even in humans, we do also know that the bacterial communities contribute or detract from our health. Now, the same group of researchers were curious to see where these bacteria are. So they used some microscopic methods uh, to investigate this. And so in these figures, the bacteria are red and yellow um, and the algae are green. And then the fungus is kind of the background here. And what they found is that those bacteria can be on the surface of these lichens. Um, they can be surrounding the algae. They can be throughout the thallus. So it kind of just depends, but they're, they're really all over the lichen. And then circling back to the lungwort lichen, just for a minute here, um, another group of researchers had a, this question about, you know, do the bacteria disperse with the lichens? Do they kind of like hitch a ride with the dispersal propagules for the lichens? And so what they did was look at these little packets of fungi and algae that the lungwort lichen makes to um, propagate itself clonally. And again, in this figure, we see the bacteria as these yellow and these red small points. Um, and then the algae are in green. And indeed, these little, these dispersal packets are just covered in bacteria as well. So they seem to be taking their bacterial communities with them. Now, a lot of the um, mechanics of these interspecies interactions comes down to chemistry and it comes down to chemical signaling um, and to particular molecules, right? So all of that symbiont communication, the work of nitrogen and carbon fixation comes down to the chemistry of these organisms. And indeed lichens are little chemical powerhouses. So they produce over a thousand 
compounds that no other organisms on this planet make. And in many cases, they actually excrete the compounds onto the outside of their hyphae. And you can even see them uh, in microscopic images. And these compounds do a number, they have a number of different functions for the lichens. So um, they function as sunscreen, you know, like many lichens are exposed to lots of ultraviolet radiation, which is really problematic uh, for if you want to keep your DNA intact and functioning. So they reflect ultraviolet light. Um, in many cases, the secondary, these compounds um, really help defend the lichens and help them keep kind of keep their territory. So if you've ever looked at like a lichen community on rocks or on bark, you might see the between the lichens, there are these like black lines and things, and there's little battles for space going on there. And then humans do use lichens. Um, they are a wonderful source of natural dyes, uh, especially the color purple. Um, I actually, I don't think you'll be able to see it, but I have this, I have a jar of fermenting lichen dye here that has become this incredibly beautiful color. Um, but many species make all sorts of colors. Um, and then there are also, um, a potential source of novel pharmaceuticals. And we already do know that many of the compounds are really strong antibiotics. So sometimes you'll see them in all natural toothpaste and all natural deodorant. Um, but you might also see things like Usnea tinctures. Um, I will say, I will sort of maybe steer you away from these because the usnic acid in uh, tink these tinctures are actually toxic uh, for your liver um, and people have died from taking too much of them. So um, I would uh, recommend maybe not going down that route. Also the harvesting of lichens isn't well managed. Um, so they making these tinctures can harm populations. But that being said, we do know that a lot of the compounds they make are great antibiotics and even have shown potential as for um, treating cancer. So can keep an eye on that. <clears throat> okay, and looking at an even smaller scale, and we're kind of getting to the point where we're connecting back to the larger scale, because that same chemistry um, that we were talking about, a lot of these acids that the lichens make are really important in the process of soil formation. So when lichens grow on rocks, they inevitably tend to grow into the rocks, start breaking them down mechanically, and then release these acids that break the rock down even further. And eventually we have um, the process of soil formation happening here. So lichens aren't the only organisms that are important for soil formation, but they certainly play a large role in it. Um, and you know, we see this come, come up sometimes as being problematic for us as humans because they grow on our monuments and gravestones and they even like recently, somewhat recently had to de-lichenize Mount Rushmore, for instance. <clears throat> and then um, with lichens are also, you know, I've mentioned this pulling carbon from the atmosphere, also pulling nitrogen from the atmosphere. And together, lichens and mosses account for 7% of the global carbon fixation every every year, so the global amount of carbon that's pulled out of the atmosphere. But more remarkably, with their powers combined, they're accounting for about 50% of global nitrogen fixation. Um, and so essentially, they're contributing this immense amount of nitrogen that is then available for other organisms in the ecosystem to access, whereas when it's in the atmosphere, they really don't have access to it. And this is all, of course, through their chemistry. Which brings me finally to the main fungal partner, the main fungus in this lichen. Um, I like to think of it as sort of the conductor, um, sort of at, standing at the podium, conducting this symphony of interactions among all of these diverse organisms, um, sort of managing all of these, managing all of this biodiversity. And yet this main fungal partner still remains a mystery to us in many ways. Um, and this is one uh, area of research that I have ongoing in my lab at Eastern. Um, we sequence lichen genomes. And to do this, we use uh, a genome sequencer called the Oxford Nanopore Minion, um, which is circled here. It's about the size of my cell phone. Um, I really, really truly feel like I'm living in the future when I'm sequencing and watching a genome being sequenced 
at my desk in my office. It's, it's really fun. And we've come upon some interesting things. So um, we sequence the entire lichen body. And so what we get out of that um, are all of those organisms that I just talked about, right? So we have the main lichen fungus um, in blue, this blue circle at the top here, we have other fungi, we gather that we have the algal DNA, we have other um, that yeast DNA if the yeast is present. And then we also have a really rich bacterial microbiome. And we've sequenced a number of species at this point, um, but I'm really interested in that main fungal partner, that main um, fungus in this relationship. And so one, what we're really trying to get at is the total DNA, all of the DNA in the lichen that is from that main lichen, right? And so if we think about this from a human perspective for a second, um, we know that in every single one of our cells, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, right? So that's kind of how our DNA is arranged in our cells. Now, in the dust lichen, what we found is that we now know that there are eight chromosomes and there's only one set of chromosomes. Now, this is pretty typical for fungi, um, especially in this group of fungi to only have one set of chromosomes instead of two. It's, I mean, definitely much more efficient than making two whole sets every time. But what we found with the wolf lichen is that it's a little bit more complicated. Um, we found that there were three different genetic entities in a single wolf lichen body, in a single individual, um, and they were at different quantities. And there are a number of different ways that this could come about. So um, in one scenario, we could see that maybe there are three whole sets of DNA in every single cell, and they're slightly different from each other. And maybe they're packaged together in the same nucleus, or there are three different nuclei, each with its own genetic makeup. Or we could consider the possibility that um, there are actually three genetic individuals all growing together and not actually like fusing their cells and, you know, uniting their DNA or some sort of combination of these three options or some, gosh, who knows, something else. So um, we're, this is a kind of an outstanding mystery, just the basic genetic makeup of the wolf lichen. <clears throat> So we also take these genomes and we look at, we look for the genes um, that underlie the production of the uh, compounds that these lichens make. So these like small sets of DNA that are actually responsible for making um, all of these different acids and various compounds, right? And so in this figure, what I'm showing you are a number of different lichen species. And then every column um, is a is a set of DNA sequences that are, uh, co are coding for different lichen compounds. And so the first thing that you might notice about this is that it seems like every species has a different set of genes for making these secondary metabolites and that for sure is true. Um, but there are also there are some columns that we see present in many species. Um, and so taking a closer look at that, um, we see this first column actually codes for a compound that's involved in making pigments, which makes sense, you know, lichens, lots of colors going on, lots of ultraviolet radiation to block. Um, we see another column here um, that, that the genes here code for uh, for a compound that is um, an antioxidant and can be made into many other antioxidants. Again, you know, libenolichen can be pretty stressful. You have to take care of these free radicals somehow that will otherwise cause damage to cells and to DNA. Now this is, but what I think is really interesting about this avenue of inquiry is that we can put some you know, some names on some of the genes we're finding, but most of them we can't because they've never been characterized. Um, so this is again, one of those big mysteries and one like there's just a really rich um, area of research with many things left to be discovered. And so at this point, I'm just, I'll bring it back around um, looking at all of these scales of influence that lichens have on the environment. And I, what I really hope that you take away from this talk is that if when you next go outside and you look at lichens, 
uh, that you will appreciate just how much is going on in that individual lichen um, that maybe you hadn't thought of before. And that we still have a lot to discover about these organisms. <clears throat> now, one of my main theses here was that lichens only exist through interspecies interactions. And indeed, we could, we could actually make this claim about all biodiversity on the planet, right? So from mycorrhizal fungi associated with trees to corals, predator-prey interactions, pollinators, you know, ants involved in many symbioses. But I would argue that lichens are one of the most exquisite examples of this. Um, and that through by looking at lichens and learning about them, we can learn a lot about the broader environment. And I also hope that um, you have maybe a new appreciation for lichens. And when we think about global biodiversity and we're talking about conservation of biodiversity, um, we sometimes tend to focus on a few species. Um, but what I hope I convinced you of today is just how interconnected all of biodiversity is. Um, and so I will leave you with a quote by Sir da from Sir David Attenborough. He said, it is the range of biodiversity that we must care for the whole thing rather than just one or two stars. Okay, thank you.